madam we are live now shall we start yes so good evening dr aishuman on behalf of shield healthcare welcoming you all uh, in another very important and interesting session with uh, professor dr a sampath kumari madam on adnexal mass in adolescent and uh, Although, madam, doesn't need any kind of interaction, but uh, it's my responsibility to uh, give a few words. So, madam is the chief and uh, head of the department of uh, Muthukumar Medical College and Research Center, Chennai. Yeah, madam was the Foxy Vice President elect 2022 and uh, founder secretary TNFOG. So, with this short introduction, I request uh, madam to take over the session. And uh, meanwhile, I request all the participants uh, for your active participation. And please post your queries on the dashboard of the Shield Connect page. So, once the talk will be over, we shall have a short discussion on this topic uh, with Madam. So thank you very much, Madam, once again for your valuable time on Shield Connect. And over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Saman. One minute. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Suman. And I thank uh, Shield uh, for the opportunity. Hope this is the sixth uh, adolescent series, I think. We are continuously talking on adolescents starting from puberty menorrhagia. So once again, I welcome all the delegates. And now we can have uh, the topic on adnexal mass in adolescent. As all of us know, the adolescent, as per WHO, it is from 10 to 18 years. Adolescents, neither they are children nor an adult. So it is a transition from childhood to adulthood. So today's population, 22% of the population is adolescent. By 2030, as per statistics and studies, it tells that it will reach 40%. India is the one country where the adolescent population is highest. Adolescents have a lot of problems. And we do counseling regarding the nutritional health, menstrual health, PCOS, sexual health, and the vaccination. And this is one, adnexal mass in adolescent. Most of the time, the adolescent may not be knowing what uh, the problem happening. When they have some pain or when there is some uneasy, they will come and tell the parents and the parents will bring the child to us. So 10 to 19 years, 18 years, what are all the masses can happen? What are all the swellings that can happen in adolescence? This is the topic today we are going to discuss. Adnexal masses in children, that is adolescent, a variety of lesions, that is besides the uterus, the tube and the ovary, this area, both this area, we consider it as the adnexal masses. So what are all the things that can be there? It can be a tubal mass, it can be a ovarian mass. Sometimes there may be a non-gynecological masses of appendix or something like they're different. And the infections related to infection, infection causes or the pregnancy, lesions. Infection means from the tuberculosis. Then tuberculosis is present means there may be a hydrosal things. In the pregnancy, there may be ectopic. So the adnexal mass includes gynecological problem of pregnancy also and the tubal and the ovarian mass. See, these are all the common, um, what are all the masses which we see which is cystic and solid. Ovarian mass, how we are classifying the adnexal masses. First, we consider the cystic masses and then we consider the solid masses. With the cystic masses, what are all the things that can happen with ovaries? Functional cyst, endometriosis, benign, malignant, ovarian neoplasms. And the solid again, benign and the malignant. If it is not a watery and if any components are present, it is a, a solid mass. Again, the fallopian tube, tube ovarian mass, hydrosulfine, sparatubal cyst. And the solid P will be most of the time ectopic. Nowadays, we see, I have seen uh, last month one case of ectopic in ovary itself, ovarian pregnancy. So the ectopic pregnancy commonly in the tube and the tube ovarian abscess uh, and with the intrauterine fibroid. If fibroid is present in the broad ligament, it is in the cervical, it may be presenting as an adnexal mass also, but it will not come as adnexal mass. It has to be differentiated from the uterus. And the bubble with the distended colon is being cystic and solid being appendicitis, diverticulitis, diverticular abscess and colon cancer. 
So what are all the adnexal masses that can happen? First, benign or malignant ovarian mass. When it is an adnexal mass in adolescent means, first we have to think of ovarian mass. If it is cystic and it's a clear cyst, it is a benign. If it is a complex cyst with the paratuma markers increased, it is a malignant. So we don't think that the malignant ovarian mass is not common in adolescent. There are ovarian masses such as mature teratoma, all immature teratoma, that they are, they are present in the adnexal area. Then comes the ovarian system. This is the simple system. It can be the follicular system, that is the follicular as of us know, it goes up to 2 centimeters. Sometimes it may get enlarged. So if it is with the ovarian stimulations or whatever it is, the cyst may get enlarged and it may be a simple cyst or some, if it is a torsion, if the cyst is very large and there is a torsion happens with the ovarian ligament, then it becomes hemorrhagic also. In that time, if the patient the girl will have tenderness. So the ovarian cyst with last pedicle may even go for ovarian torsion. If it is an ovarian torsion, it is an emergency. So Next comes the PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. We think that pelvic inflammatory disease is only after the reproductive age. Even with the adolescent, menstrual hygiene is very, very important. Menstrual hygiene, previously we had clothes, then we came to the Dana diapers, and now the clothes, now most of them are using even the menstrual cup. Whatever the menstrual cloth or diaper uh, they are used, it has to be changed once in six hours. If it is not followed, the menstrual hygiene, washing the private parts and the urinary places, if it is, again, it will produce the infection, that the ascending infections will produce the PAD. Again, pelvic inflammatory disease is present even in the adolescents. That is because of the menstrual hygiene, which is not maintained properly. Then comes the ectopic pregnancy, adolescent. Previously, we think the ectopic pregnancy only with the women who has got married. Now, we saw one case, an unmarried girl. Now the girls, they tell that we are um, history of amenorrhea and have a pain means if she is whether sexually active. When we ask the history, most of the time they will not tell. But anyway, we have to rule out the pregnancy also. And the ectopic pregnancy is also possible as a case of adnexal mass in adolescent. So benign and malignant ovarian mass, simple cyst with the torsion, PID and ectopic pregnancy. Then the Mullerian anomalies, both the side it happens and fuses and produces the vaginal septum like that. If it is a unicorn wet and if it is a rudimentary horn with the simple, this Mullerian anomalies can also be felt as the adnexal masses, which can be which sometimes can be really need surgeries. And the paratubal, as we talked about that, the adnexal is tube and the ovary. So from the tubal, there may be a cyst may be present. And sometimes hydrosalphins may be present with the tubes enlarged. These are all the ma ma masses from the tube. It can be from the right side or left side. Most of the time, the ovarian torsion happens on the right side, the left side, because of the descending colon, which is supports it. The torsion is common in the right side. Then comes the endometriosis. Now, the incidence of endometriosis, that is chocolate cyst of ovary, has increased and itself it produces a mass, that is the endometrioma. So that means for everything, the lifestyle changes is the reason for all uh, these uh, problems most of the times, the endometrioma. Finally, again, this benign and malignant ovarian mass, as I told, cystic teratoma, dermoid, it can be a malignancy. So these are all the different types of adnexal masses we are going to see. Simple cyst, torsion, PID, ectopic, anomalous, tubal mass, endometrioma, and then benign and malignant ovarian mass. What the normal, the girl complains, the girl will complain of acute abdominal pain in torsion. But other uh, muscles, it will produce only a pain. And they will, uh, sometimes the girls will tell that some, some swelling is there. Some, uh, I can palpate something like that. They will tell, tell the parents and the parents will bring the patients to us. So sometimes now you see our vomiting and precocious puberty, if it is uh, with a, uh, uh, hormonal masses, endocrinological causes, it may produce the precocious puberty and the vaginal bleeding with the granular cell, endodermal sinus may be present. So these are all the uh, symptoms which they present. And again, as we first considered the cystic and solid, the ovarian mass and the adnexal mass can be benign 
or malignancy. Malignancy is germ cell tumors, it's got tumors, epithelial tumor, and there may be a metastasis. If there is any viral lymphoma, leukemia, anything, it can also produce the metastasis. Benign BB, as I told now, functional cyst, corpus luteal cyst, hydrosulfing, tubal cyst, endometrioma, metro cystic teratoma, cyst adenoma, ectopic pregnancy, tubo ovarian mass, and mullerian anomalies, PID. And the non gynecological causes be peritoneal inclusion cyst, appendicitis, or appendicular abscess. If the appendicitis is not treated and if it is subsided with the antibiotics, sometimes it can produce the mass which will resemble the adnexal mass. So these are all the differential diagnoses for adnexal masses in adolescent. What is the prevalence of adnexal mass? It is normally 2 to 8 percent. So if the prevalence is 2 to 8 percent of this, how many of them need surgery? Only 2.6 cases per 1 lakh person. So the incidence is 2 to 8 percent and only 2.6 of the lab cases needs the surgery. Otherwise, observation and medical management can be followed. 9 percent to 11 percent of adnexal masses in this age, that is 10 to 18 years, are malignant. So the malignancy is only 9 to 11 percent. 2 to 8 percent is common with all problems with the adolescent. And 9 to 11 percent is only malignant, so other 88 percent are benign only. Most adolescent adnexal masses are benign pathology. So, the adnexal mass, most of the time it is benign, only 10 percent being the malignancy. If it is a malignancy, means what will be the symptoms? Is there any different symptoms are present? No, same abdominal pain may be present, the mass may be palpable, it may be bigger. And if you put the leading question, we can see. The poor appetite, they will complain and they, uh, loss of appetite, loss of weight, constipation, nausea, vomiting. For the, uh, with the, uh, mostly they will tell the duration will be very minimal, two months or three months. Ovary is the only thing which is not covered with the peritoneum. So it is a fast growing tumor, ovarian mass. So once the patient identifies, it will be very big. That will be up to the umbilicus itself. The same problem in the perimenopausal, postmenopausal reproductive. So, if it is malignancy, the poor appetite, weight loss, constipation has to be elicited. And the urinary frequency, since it is a very big, it may press on the bladder or the ureter and the urethra, it will produce the urinary frequency and they may be asymptomatic and repeated difficulties also will be present. So, these are all the complaints with the malignancy. Only thing extra is abdominal pain and tenderness is the same as the benign. But only thing is loss of appetite loss of weight and uh, constipation may be present. How are we going to diagnose? Once the patient comes, means we have to elicit the history. When she attained the menarche, whether the bleeding was regular, menstruation lasting for how many days, whether it is uh, present once in a month or once in two months, whether it is associated with pain, any dysmenorrhea, pain associated with the menstruation is dysmenorrhea. And uh, whether the family history is present, ovarian history means whether the mother is having any ovarian mass or any other gastrointestinal mass, family history, anything is present, whether she is suffering from any other disease, any other disease means infections, um, tuberculosis, a fever, like that, the gonorrhea, this are all we have to elicit. But repeated history of fever is present, we can know that they are having some infections. So history elicitation is very, very important. And then examinations. Most of the time, the adolescent girls may not cooperate. So simply, very casually, superficially, we have the examine. Pervagenal examination is not done for adolescent. So by parabdominal examination only, we have to see. If the mass is big, we can identify it. If it is less than four, it will be difficult. Normally, it is picked out once they do the scan for some other complaints. So what is the diagnosis which confirms the adnexal masses? ultrasonogram picture, USG. So from the USG, you are doing the ultrasound USG pelvis, ultrasonogram of the pelvis. What are all the things? Now we know that there is an unnatural mass is present. From the ultrasound, we can see whether it is a simple cyst or whether it is a complex cyst. Simple cyst only with the fluid or whether it is with the components, whether it is without septations or with the septations, from the septations, any growth is coming. So these are all the structures, uh, points we can get it from the ultrasound. Simple cyst or malignant cyst, benign, 
or solid or complex masses. When we palpate, we can see the uniform consistency. Sometimes it will be with the variable consistency. If it is variable consistency, mean with the ultrasound, we can see that they are having the complex mass. We have some score also, IOTA score and any scores with this, with the IOTA scores, with the ovarian volume and the duration, we can see the whether it is a benign mass or malignant mass. Ultrasound scoring itself will help us to identify whether it is a benign mass or malignant mass. And uh, with the ultrasound, we can differentiate it whether it's from the adnectal mass or it is from the gastrointestinal appendicular mass. If the USD abdomen is also done, you can differentiate it if it is from the pelvis mass or the other masses. And the uterine pathology, sometimes in the uterus, a fibroid, anything was present, any additions, if it, if it is presenting as an unnatural mass, that can be differentiated from the ultrasound. So it can differentiate the simple or complex, whether it is benign or malignant with the scoring, or it is a mass from the gastrointestinal, or it is a mass from the uterine. So confirmation must be from the ultrasound. But with the history and the examination, we should come to the conclusion that the mass is arising from the pelvic organ. Then for confirmation only we are having the ultrasound. If you are not clear with the ultrasound, since we are not able to do the pervaginal examination, rectal examination also will be difficult for an adolescent girl. So you can confirm with MRI or CT scanning. MRI with the malignancies and the CT scan to confirm the features of the ultrasound. So MRI and CT can be advised to confirm the findings with the ultrasound. If you are so confident with the ultrasound, then there is no necessity for MRI. Then the tumor markers. If it is always, we know that if it is an ovarian carcinoma, CA-125. CA-125 more than 35 means we should suspect it is not a, a only indicator. It can be increased in endometriosis and it can be increased in endopic in other causes, that natural markers. It can be increased. So the other tumor markers which are associated with the natural markers, beta HCG, that is human chorionic gonadotrophin, alpha theta protein, LDG, lactate dehydrogenase, inhibin, Carcino embryonic antigen that is increased in the epithelial tumor CEA, and there comes the cancer antigen CA125, which is the thing we are normally doing. Significantly elevated CA125. If it is 500, 600, then we can say we can think that she may be having malignancy. The patient non-communicating mutant horn in those with the task and nectar also is present. Then comes the Markers, where are all it is increased? This germinoma, LDH will be present. Choreo carcinoma, beta HCG will be present. Immature teratoma, CA19 and 9 will be present. Endodermal sinus tumor, alpha feta protein. Embryonal carcinoma means alpha feta protein and beta HCG. CA125 present increased in epithelial tumors. So, with the tumor markers, we can have some clue that the mass is arising from the, it is useful only in the malignancy, not in the benign cases, only for the malignancy, whether it is arising from the epithelial cells or whether it is arising from the six cord cells or whether it is arising from the choriocarcinoma like that vesicular mold, that can be known from the tumor markers. So what is the treatment? Depending on the case, depending on the complaints, depending on the findings, the treatment varies, adnectal mass. For each, it has to be individualized. So if it is a cyst, small means, you can go for observation. And sometimes some hormonals can be given to shrink the masses. If the cyst is very big and it is about more than 8 to 10 centimeter means, it has to be gone for surgery. Otherwise, it will go for a torsion. So cystectomy can be done or in oophorectomy, if the cyst is not separately removable, it has to be removed with the ovary. So since in the adolescence, normally we don't prefer the salping or oophorectomy. This is with the malignant cases, with the reports only, unilateral salping or oophorectomy can be done. If you don't have the contrary, what is going to happen? If it is a tarsion or if it is a ectopic, so laparotomy or laparoscopy. So surgery is possible is a simple cystectomy or if it, the ovary is associated as the far as possible, ovarian tissue has has to be preserved in adolescence. Only the cyst has to be removed 
and the injured ovary alone has to be removed. See, a salping of fractomy, preferably not done. That can be done only with the malignant cases with the consultation with the oncologist. So whatever the treatment we are doing, the fertility preservation is very, very important. Nowadays with the malignancy also, before they start the chemotherapy or whatever therapy they are given, they pick up the ovum and they go for the frozen ovum, frozen embryo. Everything is nowadays done. So fertility preservation is a separate chapter that is important in anexal muscles. Now we will see each one by one. So the PID, PID cases means pelvic inflammatory disease. Patient will have pain and it is cervical motion tenderness, but we are not doing pervagenal examination for an adolescent. History of fever will be present. History of white discharge will be present. When we see the ultrasound, the TO mass, complex, thick walled, multi septation present with echogenic internal debris. Septation circle, we will see the echogenic internal debris will be there. So what is the treatment, CDC treatment, if it is the PID? PID means, as I told, it could be from the menstrual hygiene if it is not maintained, and it can be from the gonorrhea, or it can be from the chlamydia, or it can be from the tuberculosis. Any ascending infections will produce the PID. So normally we are given is cephatoxins of two gram IV every 12th hour, alternatively two gram IV every sixth hour plus doxycycline 100 milligram. So, uh, cephalosporin group or the doxycycline can be given combined. It can be given as a OP procedure or if needed, the patient can be admitted and given for five days or a week. So, if the PID mass, if it is getting ruptured, if the is enclosed with tubo ovarian mass first, if, uh, when, well, uh, for four, uh, previously, that is in 80s and 90s, we used to have a lot of septic abortions. Even in an unmarried girl, in that cases, what will happen sometimes? It will be formed like uh, uh, surgical pus collection will be seen as an abdominal mass, uh, adnexal mass. In that cases, we have to go for surgical explorations and the drainage. So the so drainage, it can be done with the, nowadays with the interventional radiology, it can be aspirated or with the laparotomy procedures, it has to be given. Once there is a septic uh, cases means give the antibiotic, control the antibiotic. Uh, infections and then go for a laparotomy or whatever it is unless it is an emergency. So pelvic inflammatory disease. Then comes the ectopic. If the adolescent girl comes with a history of amenorrhea, most of the time they tell me it is a PCOS, I get the bleeding once in three months or once in two months. So if you have a suspicion, better to go for the urine pregnancy test or the ultrasound pictures. If you tell the urine pregnancy test also, they may not be liking so better to go with the uh, ultrasound features or picture. So if it is an ectopic, you have you can confirm with the beta HCG also. If it is 1,500 to 2,000 by the transvaginal ultrasound and 6,000 milliunits from transabdominal ultrasound means the history of amenorrhea and uh, right side adnexal um, uh, pain, uh, abdominal pain present, bleeding present means think of ectopic, do the beta HCG with these levels. Definitely, it is a um, ectopic um, anywhere. It can be in the uterus or it can be in the uh, tube. But we have to confirm it with the ultrasound and see ectopic. So what is the treatment we are going to give? So if normally, if it is an ectopic, we are going to do the salpingostomy and um, remove that products from the small incisions over the tube and uh, make, uh, products of conception has to be removed. So that is with the tubal pregnancy. Next, the tube alone can be removed. That is salpingectomy. So better to remove the salpingectomy. If you leave the tube, there is a possibility for ectopic in the next time also. So nowadays we go with the salpingectomy or now the medical management are very good. So see the beta HCG and see the size of the um, uh, ectopic and the heartbeats with that, we can go for the medical management. Medically stable patients satisfying the criteria that is uh, if I only 50 days of amenorrhea and a small sack of less than 2 millimeter centimeters and the heartbeat is not present. In that cases, you can go for medical management with the injection methotrexate 500 milligram IM. And we have to repeat the methotrexate on the fourth day and it has to be repeated on the seventh day. If needed, the second dose can be given. Otherwise, with the single dose itself, it will get subsided and has to be followed. The beta 
and thinking has to be followed. So medical management is also very, very helpful with the ectopic that whoever the cases fulfilling the criteria. So if a girl is an unmarried also, think of ectopic pregnancy if the patient comes with shock or pain, not only shock, pain and anaxal mass. As I told the anomalous, mullerian anomalies affect up to the 7% of the female population. What are all the anaxal masses associated with uh, mullerian anomalies? Is vaginal agenesis, segmental vaginal atresia, transverse vaginal septum, uterine diadelphus, and unicorn weight uterus, sometimes imperfect hymen. So, uh, blood uh, bleeding cannot come out and it will be collected and it can be protected as the adnexal mass from the uterus, from the tuber, hematometra, tumor uh, uh, involvement and everything, the uh, blood collections will be in the adnexa. So, imperfect hymen. These are all the anomalous. Imperfect hymen is a simple treatment. Patient will give monthly pain regularly and no bleed. So, when we examine, we can see the hymen. A cruciate incision is made and the bleedings are let out and she will be free. So, these are all the anomalous which produces the adnexal mass. So for confirmation, you can go the MRI and lab and see what is there and depending on the treatment should be given. Then common is the ovarian cyst. What is the cyst may be? It may be the functional and it can be the non-functional. The functional ovarian cyst being the physiologic ovarian cyst or the carpus luteal cyst. Normally the carpus luteal cyst around the, after ovulation, if it is increasing, it becomes the carpus luteal cyst. So how this cyst happens? This is from the excessive response to FSH stimulation and fail to involve. Once the ovulation is happened, it will collapse and it will get irregular. But when it is failing to envelope, the cyst will measure to more than four to five centimeters. Five to six centimeters will be persistently present. And sometimes you can leave it for observation. And if it is not getting observed and if the cyst is very big, and then you have to go for a surgery. Normally, the size less than 4 cm will resolve by itself. That is, in 2 or 3 cycles, it will get resolved. This simple ovarian cyst. What are all the complications of the ovarian cyst? Simple, if the, um, as I told, the cyst with the ovarian ligament, that ovarian rupture can happen. The large cyst may cause, may cause the ovary to leak and suddenly it will get ruptured and it will be an, an emergency. As I told, the internal bleeding can be present in the system and it will be hemorrhagic cyst and it will be very, very painful. And the torsion in this, the, with the ovary, the torsion uh, cyst will be getting uh, twisted, the twisting uh, will produce the pain to the patient. So when we see with the ultrasound, the tors uh, torsion of the cyst will, can be seen easily. In that cases, most probably it will end up in emergency surgery. Dobler alone cannot identify the torsion. So we have some guidelines. Non-functional cyst is, what are all the non-functional cysts? It is cyst adenomas. Develop on the ovarian surface and it is filled with thin watery fluid or thick mucus-like material. Cyst will be there, it will be watery or mucus. That is cyst adenoma. Sometimes dermoid cyst, that is teratoma. It is contains the epidermis, mesoderm, endoderm, all three layers will be present. And it will have from the embryonic cells and it will have hair, skin, teeth. Everything will be present. Even the dermoid cyst, when large, it can also go for a twist. So torsion is common even in dermoid cyst. Finally, the endometriomas. Non-functional ovarian cyst is cyst adenomas and dermoid cyst and endometriomas. Endometrioma is due to the endometriosis. The endometrium present in the ovary, which is leading to the chocolate cyst. Most of the time in the adolescent endometriosis, medical management is advised. You can go with the progestons or DMP. If it is an endometrium and if it is a mass, in that case, better you have to go for a golden star, uh, diagnosis for endometriosis is laparoscopy. So with the laparoscopy, you have to see the endometrium and if possible, remove only the cyst endometrium. Cyst alone has to be removed. This is the benign serous mucinous cyst adenoma, which is 1.4 to 2.6. That is, uh, it can be a small size or bigger size, small size, you can go for observation. Bigger sizes, now we see 5 kg, 4 kg, whatever it is. The cyst can be aspirated rather than going for a big incision. The cyst can be aspirated with a needle and it can be removed with a simple, uh, small incision or it can be removed with a laparoscopy, whichever is convenient for the patient, affordable for the patient and whichever the surgeon is 
uh, expert, whether if they are not comfortable with the laparoscope, they have to go for laparotomy. But uh, for an adolescent, it is better to do a laparoscopic removal. Nowadays, all are well versed with the laparoscope. This dermoid, as I told, with the ultrasound, this like features will be seen. Fat fluid levels and white wall-like appearance and uh, there will be the dermoid mesh. Sometimes if teeth is present also, it can be seen in the uh, ultrasound pictures. Uh, these are all the features will be present in the ultrasound. And then you can, if needed, you can go for MRI assist to confirm or you can proceed with the surgery. Cystectomy, contralateral side, you have to verify whether it is normal. It is not necessary that the other ovary also have to be removed. As far as possible, remove only the dermoid system. In the case of adolescent, always preserve the ovarian tissue. This is one which I saw that is a case of critical torsion of ovarian dermoid system. It was reported in 1989 itself. One year and eight months old girl which uh, had a uh, torsion of ovarian dermoid system. So still the conditions are going on. So even for a baby, we have to suspect because you do the ultrasound and it's possible MRI and the open procedure, it has to be removed. Then comes the endometrioma. As I told, uterine glands and stroma found in the ovarian tissue. Hormonal stimulation is the chocolate cyst. For chocolate cyst, preferably medical management. And if it has become an endometrioma and it has become as an adnexal mass, in that case, is confirmed with the MRI. MRI is the diagnosis for endometrial cyst. And then with the laparoscopy, you can remove the endometrioma. So laparoscopic procedure is best to remove the endometrioma. For dermoid cyst, you can remove the, uh, you know, laparoscopically, dermoid can be removed, but it will get ruptured as far as possible with their bag. You can have the gloves or whatever it is, endo bag. That will be the endo bag. And the spill of the particles should be avoided in case of dermoid. Similar with the endometriosis also, but you can do with the laparoscopy. Medical management or surgical, as far as possible, try to do with the medical management. If it is not subsiding, go with the surgical. Nowadays, DMPA, metroxyprogestone acetate, and the uh, progestone 2 milligram is uh, now we have the ocipils combination also with the progestone for the endometriosis. Uh, that can be given. Now we have discussed about the simple cyst, functional and the corpus luteal cyst, and the non functional cyst of the dermoid, um, cystadenoma, endometrioma, and we have discussed about the ectopic also. Then comes the tubal, tarsion. Tubal is tubal from the tube, the cyst may be present. It can be from the tubal or paratubal area and the peritoneal inclusion system. Again, you confirm with the ultrasound. If it is very small, you can go for observation. And if it is very big and, um, uh, and additions with mimic thin walled septations, in that cases, you have to go for surgery only. Sometimes you can go with the ocipils, low dose ocipils with the estrogen and progesterone. The cyst fluid accumulation will be decreased. The cycle can be continued for three to four cycles and then repeat the ultrasound. And if the cyst has regressed, there is no problem. If it is not regressed and if it has enlargements, then go for surgery. Surgery can be cyst aspiration, sclerotherapy, and the removal complete injection alone the cyst. As far as possible, don't remove the ovary. Hydrosulfins. This is the hydrosulfins. In this hydrosulfins, hydrosulfins is blocked, dilated, fluid-filled fallopian tubes. See this, if both the side, if the single side means, you can remove it. If both the side means, what to do? Hydrosulfins. It can be due to some infections. Most of the time, hydrosulfins, the tuberculosis has to be ruled out. With the ultrasound, it will be a sausage shape. And you can confirm it with the MRI. So if it is small, very small dilated, you can go for observation. If the hydrosulfins is big and if it is palpable and patient is having pain, means the surgery has to be removed. Again, comfortable can do with the laparoscope. If you are not comfortable, go with the laparoscope. So as I told, the hydroscopy, uh, hydrosulfins is ascending infection by chlamydia, gonorrhea, and tuberculosis. The presence of hydrosulfins is what to do in case of I IVF. Suppose nowadays uh, in uh, adolescence, it is not uh, uh, normally we are based the marriage only after 18 years. If at all they are getting married in the 16 years, or we will advise them to postpone the pregnancy in spite of that, if uh, the ectopic is possible. But in case of IVF, that is after adolescent, not with adolescent, in the case of adolescent. 
uh, adult, that is after 19 years, the hydrosalkin fluid is very toxic and it will be spilled into the uterus uh, and it will prevent the implantations and watch the transferred embryos. So hydrosalkin should be removed in case of IVF cases. Uh, and uh, Next, uh, yeah, so hydrosulfing with IVF means the hydrosulfing, uh, first they will remove the hydrosulfing and then only they will go for in vitro fertilization. The torsion already I have uh, discussed, ovarian uh, twist with the vascular support, that is with the infant pelvic ligament containing the ovarian artery and the vein. First the venous obstructions and then the artery. Sometimes the ovary will be enlarged. See, this is the twist, four times it has uh, twisted, that is the torsion. You normally ovary will be enlarged and edematous. If it is continuing, it will go to the ovarian ischemia and necrosis. Finally, the ovarian function will be lost. So, the, if it is a twist, um, twice or thrice, uh, the patient will have severe pain. Immediately, patient should be taken for surgery. If you are um, even in the emergency in the night or day, you can go with the laparoscopic removal. The torsions has to be. Deep torsion has to be detoxified, the reverse leak has to be removed. And if needed, the cyst has to be removed. And the cyst is there. Once it has torsion has undergone means better to remove the cyst. So the cyst has to be removed. So delayed of the if the sometimes what happens, the patient will have pain. So the if it is a single twist only, it will get reversed, de-twisted, and the pain will have uh, subsided. And the patient, when they go for the scan, the twist uh, ovarian, they, the USD, they would have mentioned that deep twisting has happened. So the, the for deep twisting is also possible. That is very, very rare. If you are going to delay the treatment, the ovarian function will be delayed. So in this case, four twist means definitely surgery has to be done. The dobler for torsion, it is not at all the diagnosis. We can do it. So final treatment is at, uh, surgery. What are all the predisposing factors for this torsion is congenitally long ovarian ligament, excessive laxity of the pelvic ligaments, small uterus that allows more space for the adnexa, and the lower rate of term, as I told, uh, first itself I told, that torsion is common in the right side rather than the left side because in the left side, it is a protective nature of the descending colon. So, over a ligament, if it is long and laxity of pelvic ligament, small uterus, they are the predisposing factors. That's all. That is not, that not only produces the torsion. Sometimes nowadays what they do for the purpose of the infertility, nephrofixy can be given. That is, fixes the ovary in a position. If the tube uh, ligament is long and they were fix it to the round ligament or like that, wherever it is needed, it can be fixed to avoid the repeat torsion, uh, um, repeat torsion can be avoided by fixing it. And the contralateral ovary is also absent, means we have to fix it with the, any other place, that is the ophrophexy. This is torsion guidelines, that is sudden onset abdominal pain, intermittent non-radiating with nausea and vomiting, suspect of torsion. No clinical or imaging criteria confirms the preoperative diagnosis. Dobler flow alone should not guide, Dobler alone cannot tell that the torsion is going on. Timely intervention is important. It can be a laparotomy or it can be a laparoscopy. Recommended the detorsion, not to remove the task ovary unless ophrectomy is unavoidable. So whenever the detorsion, as I told, the detorsion, I told the detorsion when it is removed, if possible, remove the cyst alone and ovary has to be preserved. Only in unavoidable cases, the ovary has to be removed, which is called as ophrectomy. Cystectomy does not perform the, the detorsion. Now the torsion has been uh, it is a detarsion is done and cyst is normal means it doesn't mean that cystectomy also to be done once you are uh, uh, correcting the torsion. Surgeon may consider the incision and drainage of the large cyst. <coughs> they can detorsion can be done and cyst can be aspirated also and ultrasound can be done after 6 to 12 weeks and see how is the condition. Malignancy, ovarian neoplasm incidence is 2.6 per 1 lakh girls I told. 10 to 20 percent of all ovarian masses and 1 to 2 percent of all childhood malignancy. So, yeah, malignancy is with the adolescent, 1 to 2 is uh, ovarian, and 10 to 20 percent of ovarian masses are malignancy. So, germ cell tumor is 60 to 80 percent, epithelial is 15 to 20 percent, 
sex cards Roman cell is 10 to 20 percent, vaseline and is 5. So malignancy which is common in adolescent is 60 to 80 percent. 10 to 20 percent of the ovarian mass, malignancy is only 10 to 20 percent. Of all childhood malignancies, 1 to 2 percent. And this also germ cell tumor is 60 to 80 percent common. So again, dysterminoma, immature teratoma, endodermal sinus tumor, choriocastroma, polyembryoma. These are all the decreasing frequency of the malignancy. So what are all the surgeries? Again, settled removal of the tumor and sparing the fallopian tube is not adherent to the tumor and cytological washing is done, examination of the momentum and the opposite ovary has to be visualized and palpations of the nodes. If anything abnormal, immediately you can remove that also. So these are all the malignancy means first to assess whether to remove the ovary alone and momentum whether a spill is present with the MRI, you can go for the classification. If the single side, single side alone remove, other side is kept for uh, future uh, in fertility preservation. If you are going to plan for chemotherapy, Fertility preservation in malignancy only we have to think home has to be aspirated and it should be frozen and it should be kept and then go for chemotherapy. The common drug is TEB or VAC depending on the tumors. This is the yolk cell tumor, this is stromal cell tumor, this is sertoli leading cell tumor, it is gonadoplastoma. So with the ultrasound and the MRI, we can come to, with the tumor markers comes to the diagnosis and with the consultant of the oncologist, the surgery has to be done, but US fertility preservation is very, very important. Finally, the lymphoma and leukemia. Ovarian lymphoma is characterized, it may be unilateral or bilateral, solid masses, homogeneous. Again, everything by as a clinical examination alone, it cannot be uh, diagnosed, only with the investigations, imaging techniques, that is USG, tumor markers, MRI, you can come to the conclusion. But the malignancy confirmation is only with the pathology report. You remove the tumor and send to the pathologist and from the pathology report only, we have to come to the conclusions. So the benign and the malignancy, as I told, neoplastic, mature uh, fire and uh, neoplastic and non-neoplastic, mature teratoma, thecoma, luteoma, fibroma, cystadenoma. Non-neoplastic is polyclasis, hemorrhagic cysts, pubertus, endometrioma, tarsal, ectopic. Malignancy, epithelial, germ cell, sex cardiomat. Already I have discussed. So, conclusion, when an adolescent girl comes, always take the opportunity and talk to them about the nutrition, about the menstrual hygiene, about the sexual health and about the vaccination and about the mental health. Now, the incidence of suicidal tendency has increased. Even for dysmenorrhea, they think of suicidal. So, we have to put the leading question, have you attempted suicide? Have you undergone any attempted for suicide? And have you, have, do you have boyfriend? Such a question also has to be present. Then, if it is an adnexal mass, detailed history and examination from the parents, whether anyone is having or how when she attained menarche and how was the bleeding, whether the mass is correlated with the bleeding or the mass is present every time. And examinations, you have to talk to the adolescent and see you should be very smooth and gentle in examining the adolescent. Parvagenal examination is not done. Even the parental examination, it will be difficult for a, to do for an adolescent girl. So then you confirm with the imaging, that is the USB and if needed MRI, RCT, whatever it is. And the treatment has to be categorized for every case. If it is a small sister, less than three centimeter means observation. If it is a four centimeter means you can go with occipitals and uh, for two or three months and then uh, see the cyst whether it has a regular cyst, preferably tubal cyst. And uh, if needed for surgery, surgery also whether the cyst has to be removed, only cyst has to be removed as far as possible ovarian tissue has to be preserved. Only the injured or in diseased ovary and tissue alone has to be removed. So fertility preservation to be considered in case of malignant ovarian masses. Thank you. Once again, I thank the delegates and the shield for giving me an opportunity to address the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for discussing uh, such a nice and important, uh, very important topic. That I can say. Just give me one minute time, ma'am, to check uh, the questions in our dashboard, ma'am. Yes.
madam uh, one uh, question uh, mm. so is there any way to means in case of adnexal mass is there any way means uh, based on the size of the mass can it be determined as a benign or uh, malignancy no not on the size we can see whether it is simple cyst uniform in consistency if it is a clear cyst means we can see a smooth clear if it is a complex cyst means the consistency will be variable so with the size alone we cannot tell even the benign cyst can be very big 12 uh, 12 cm or 10 cm as long as the cyst is becoming larger it is possible for rupture and it is possible for torsion so with the size we cannot uh, confirm the benign and malignancy only with ultra uh, content inside only we can see that can be confirmed with the ultrasound and the mri if the multiple septations are present from the septations of growth are present it can be 4 to 5 cm very small but it will be a malignant uh, uh, teratoma so the size will not tell about the uh, benign and malignancy with the ovarian scoring there is some score ovarian volume and how many particles are there with that we can tell thank you thank you very much and all and that ca125 it is mandatory for checking for all the ovarian related masks yes all masks though it is not a definitive indicator we have to do ca125 suppose ca125 normal value is 35 if it is going above 500 400 means we can be very sure that it could be a malignancy malignancy will be confirmed only with the biopsy report take the specimen and send to pathology so if it is more than 400 500 means we can think that it could be a malignancy ca125 will be increased in endometriosis even in the pregnancy in that cases it will be increased but we have to do ca125 for all adnexal masses even thank in you, the menopausal menopausal age we are doing ca125 thank you very much ma'am and ma'am uh, uh, just one uh, question is uh, Uh, that is what is uh, means in case of this para ovarian cyst what is exactly means and how to you uh, determine means the diagnosis of para ovarian cyst it is para ovarian cyst means it is like the mesosalpings it will be between the ovary and the tube in the in between areas from the mesosalpings if it is present that is below below the ovary tube it is present it will be the para ovarian cyst in that case what will happen ovarian tissue will be normal so we are going to remove only the para ovarian cyst if it is attached with the tube means we will remove the tube otherwise the cyst alone can be it will be in between tube and the ovary thank you very much ma'am uh, so ovary is the only pelvic organ which is not covered with the peritoneum so only the ovary and uh, cyst is growing very fast it will grow even 32 up to 32 weeks size up to the umbilicus the ovarian mass will be present that the simple cyst also will be very much thank you once again i thank uh, the shield and the delegates for the uh, hearing for the thank you thank you very much ma'am i could not find any other question thank so you. once again thank you very much ma'am uh, for your valuable time in uh, shield connect platform and in future also we will look forward and uh, to learn from you in many topics thank you very much ma'am have thank a good day thank you mr saman ganesh chitrakala thank you welcome madam welcome thank you okay leave padillama ah okay ma'am yes ma'am